Hello Beanie fans and welcome to another episode of the Crap Engineering Show fronted by yours truly, everyone's favourite five year old, me. Right, in today's episode, I couldn't really think of a good name and in the uh, spirit of crap puns, is he gonna, oh jeez, is he gonna do it? Oh, bye Amini, age five. If you are not familiar with what happens now, we check the pen is working and that, if you're one of the professional people from one of these cycling teams, the pen is working is a euphemism to see if the penis is working. But, you know, there you go. Right, the disclaimer, right? <laughs> This is about whether Filippo Ganna is going to break the world hour record or not. And this is a disclaimer. Read it at your will. Um, I mean, some of these details are complete guesses. So, you know, use them at your peril. And the second line is particularly important. Right. This is Filippo Ganna. He is an Italian. I forget how old he is, but he's older than five. And this is him on his new Pinarello bike. And he's going for the hour world record um, at a place called Grenchen in Switzerland, which we all know is a neutral country full of table rounds and crap engineering. He is trying to better his kind of teammate. It's basically the, the data scientist guy for Ineos, who is Dan Bigham. So this is down on the right. Um, and this is the bike that he was riding with the seat in that position and he got 55.48 kilometers so that is a world record and uh, he did it on the 19th of August 2022. Now a lot of people asked can you do a little take on the bike now when I did this there was a lot more information going but all of a sudden it's all disappeared but I've tried to put together as much as I can. This is the bike so it's a Pinarello Belide bike. I think it's a Belide. I'm not even quite sure. And this is Ganna on top of the bike. Now he is particularly large for a cyclist. I think he weighs 83 kilos and uh, he's like 1.8 meters tall, something like that. And this is him on his bike. Now if you look at this bike from an aerodynamic perspective, there's almost two routes you can go down. You can go down the Hope bike, which is what the British cycling team did. I think they didn't win that many medals. Or you could go down this route. And this is the route that I would always take. Now this method is to sort of obliterate any ceiling surfaces or obliterate any joints so as air comes along you've got and this is a track bike you've got very very uh, big aspect ratio so in the UCI used to have a rule where if you had an aerofoil oh bollocks that's better there was a three to one rule so the width if that was one that could be three but they've changed that now so you can pretty much do what you want um and that's what this bike has tried to do so you've got very very long cords um on the forks and even here which is the head tube the head tube is hinged and that creates quite a long aerofoil cord um, a lot of time trial bikes have that even my bmc from god knows when has that the other thing is you hear that gap is very very small um so airflow as it comes across you've got that little edge where it kind of leaves the tire um you want to minimize that so you know, aerodynamically it's to get it pan flat so the air doesn't even see it it just goes past the other thing which i guess is the sort of headline thing on this bike are these like sawtooth things in here now, a proponent of those are two of the parties involved in this bike. So Princeton Carbon Works, who are supplying the wheels uh, and being sued by, by SRAM. Um, Demetris Katsanis, he works for, or he owns a company called Metron Engineering who built this bike. So this bike is manufactured out of well I'll come to that in a minute but he is into these wavy wheels and that's what this bike has so it's got these um, wavy surfaces predominantly on the seat tube well in fact it's only on the seat tube now I was having a little discussion with you know a few people about whether this would work or not and the, the conclusion was quite mixed 
I mean, there was a conclusion where everyone said, oh, fuck that, that's not going to work, because the airflow coming off his legs is all going to be mashed, and therefore, how the fuck's it going to work? And then the other one was, well, these guys aren't stupid, so they probably put it on for a reason, either to sell bikes, or it does nothing, or there may be a structural reason. I mean, the, the, the issue is, you know, to a, an aerodynamicist looking in, I can only see this working in a finite window. Yeah, at best. So if you're going at like 15 or 20 miles an hour, it may not work. It may actually be a hindrance. But at his speed, which is like going to be 56 k's per hour, um, it may make a difference. Just don't know. Um, so there we go. Uh, the other things on this bike, yeah, you've got like a very, very good seal round the back wheel to the seat tube. Uh, and then also, again, uh, sort of faults aerofoil section in here or faults you know, just a deep section ideally if you want to go really really fast you'd close off all of this um but that hasn't been the case in here the um it's a track bike so it doesn't have such things like uh, quick release levers the um chain tension is effectively governed by the position that you move the back wheel to um yeah, right. This, this bike is 3D printed and I mean, when I looked up, it was, it, well, there was a cycling tips video that was done by, I think it's Ronan McLaughlin. I might've got that wrong, which was on the internet this morning. When I had a look this afternoon, it had gone. Okay? And there was quite a lot of information in there about how this bike was made and it's additive manufacturing. So it's basically made from dust. Now the problem with making from dust is the properties and the material and the strength of the material can be quite variable depending on the geometry. The other thing I noticed, and it was quite apparent in the video that I saw, is the manufacturing um, tolerance on this is pretty shit because you've got, I mean, there was grinder marks all over it. So they probably smoothed it out, but. This is a, a screen dump that um, I saw, and you should be able to see how crap that joint is. Um, you know, it's not a flush joint at all. It's, it's quite a big gap there, given how big the tube is. That's probably a millimeter of deflection. I mean, they'll fill that with filler and all sorts of whatnot, but it's still, you know, quite, quite big deflection. Now, the Metron man, who's Demetrius, he also said, I think he said, the bike was half a kilo heavier than it could be. So there's a bit in there to uh, to take out. So there you go. Again, this manufacturing business, it, it's, I wouldn't say it's um, smoke and mirrors, but it, it's, it's a prototype bike. I imagine there's all sorts of gaffer tape, glue and stuff in there. They just don't want you to know about it. Right, this is possibly the biggest thing that you have to to consider um what i've got is on the right i've put dan bigham and on the left i've put filippo ganna the difference between the two is almost like night and day now ideally i wanted to get dan on the pinarello bike that he did the world record on but i mean the coverage of that was garbage so i haven't managed to get a side on shot but this is him on a, a ribble bike that i flipped through 90 uh, flipped horizontally so you can you can gauge it on here but the the thing is i mean if you look at his position look at that that is absolutely perfect absolute you couldn't really get any better than that now there are some anthropometrical advantages that he has um now i asked a famous hairdresser to have a look at dan not in that way i might add and she said in her uh, medical opinion, he's got a slightly longer neck than average. I don't mean that disparagingly or disrespectfully. It's just advantageous for him. Um, it makes him a lot more, the ability to be slung out more and a lot more aerodynamic. Now, if you take Ghana here, I mean, the difference is massive. Look at the length of his lower leg versus Dan here um, it is huge and then the difference between the seats you know the dif dif difference between the bottom bracket and where he sits I mean that's like towering above 
it's hugely different. The key thing that I think that Filippo has to do is he's got to get that arm position right. Um, and I think it's going to be this more than the bike that affects the outcome. The bike is one thing, but positioning a massive rider onto that bike is more of a challenge. What I've done now is I have overlaid Dan onto Filippo Ganna. Now this may be a bit difficult to see, but if I draw the outline of Dan, and what I've done is I've sort of zeroed on the wheels, there's the outline of Dan Bigham. That is the outline of Filippo Ganna. Now straight away, the difference in frontal area is massive. It's huge. If you think, you know, that may be, what, five or six centimetres at least. Um, it's probably more than that. And trying to position him on that bike is, is, is the challenge. Now, the thing that you can also see from Dan's position is his hands are lower. Um, and Filippo's are more tucked in towards his head. This is going to be a compromise between... C, D, and A, <laughs> okay? So the, the, the guesses are, you know, how do you minimize your frontal area, but that affects your C, D. Now, one other thing that people asked me for was, what about the numbers behind it? Well, here we go. So this is basically a back of a cigarette packet or a condom packet with indelible pen, sort of fuck around of the numbers involved. So. This is speed, so I've put in 55.6 kph, 15.4 meters per second that equals. The power put out, 460 watts, and then the rolling resistance loss effectively. So it's a track bike, um, and you know, he's gonna be on very high pressure uh, tires. I don't think his rolling resistance is gonna be that much. It might be 15 watts, it might be 30 watts, don't really know. That gives you a delta power output of 445 watts. Now, I would stress that the accuracy of this is a bit ropey, because um, I just don't know. In terms of the transmission difference, he's only got a got, he's got two bearings in the front wheel, two bearings in his bottom bracket, and two bearings in the back wheel. So he's got a total of six bearings versus the normal bicycle, which will have uh, an additional two bearings for the uh, uh, rear mech and all of the paraphernalia, the weight, the drag associated with all that crap. And he's also not got the quick release levers, all of that lot. So none of that exists. And none of the pumping losses exist because it's going to be on two discs. If you work all that out, you get 445 watts. Um, there's just a fag packet. Um, drag equals power over velocity it gives you that air density i've assumed that that gives you cda of 0.19 now we can frig this so if we went to let's say 56.1 i'm assuming gamma is putting out 460 watts i don't know for that for sure is cda is 0.19 so a typical time trial list will be 0 0.23 0 0.24 0 0.19 is is really getting low the, the, the thing is, if let's say he moves his head by a few centimetres, I mean, you can see the difference. It's like that, we'd call the third decimal place a click. So it's, it's minuscule numbers that will have an effect on there. So he's absolutely maxing everything out. Now, if you took Dan Bigham, and his world record was 55.54, was it? I can't remember. 55.548 um, and I think his power was like 350 I mean look at that CDA okay okay it's a fag packet calculation but 0.14 that's the huge difference so Gannon's putting out probably a lot more power but Dan has used his brains and, and his probably his anthropometrical proportions and then squeezed the drag out to a low and your CDA low very low value Obviously, it is a guess, but you know you're in that sort of ballpark figure. Now, some people, you know, questioned well, what effect does density have on the um, on the value? So, if you were to say, let's say, be at altitude, you could get away with a much worse CDA 
um, and then still achieve the same time. So you can, you know, it can work both ways. Again, I will just stress this is a you know, a ballpark figure calculation. And that is it. If you've got a guess, I'm going for 56.3. You get a guess, whack it in below and we'll see who's closest. And the winner might get some stickers or whatever. I'm not promising that, but we'll see. Right, and that's the end of the video. If you did enjoy it, remember to smash that like button. If you didn't, go screw yourself. And as always, keep banging that hairdresser.